sure I've said that live before. The full Tom experience, yeah. yeah. Whenever... Hello and welcome. To... <laughs> Start again, shall I? Pro levels. Yeah. On you go. Hello <laughs> and welcome to the unlucky. Are oh, you mother? <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast. You are joined by your usual hosts here. We've got uh, Tom Mannering. Hello. And myself, Josh Hartley. How are we doing this week, Tom? I'm doing good, thank you very much, Josh. How are you? Grand, yeah. Good good week. We're we're recording on Friday, so the the work is done. The weekend is ahead of us. Uh, Tom's shaking his head. I forgot he's working tomorrow. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to that in. Salt in I'm kind of yeah, just... glad I interrupted you on that last start now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is us even, I guess. Hey, uh, <laughs> working week's over for me, so... <laughs> anyway, Tom has flipped me the, the middle finger there. Uh, yeah, uh, so we've got a few things to talk about uh, this week. Uh, what, what have you been up to this week? Uh, not a great deal. Uh, to be honest, I had a, I've got a few bits and bobs to talk about. I suppose the big one for us, and I don't know if you want to get into this right away, but is we had the finale, 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 finale. I <laughs> went a bit posh there. Uh, finale, of, finale <laughs> of yeah. our uh, our Pathfinder uh, campaign. Our sort of second finale, really, um, because we did have one previously, but then I decided I wasn't happy with that, so I wanted to do another one. So on Tuesday, mm-hmm. uh, we had our our sort of end to the mythic arc, uh, if you will, of our, our Pathfinder campaign. So you guys had hit like level 14, 15, 14. something like that. Uh, yeah, it was 14. And uh, we wrapped up the, the storyline, which was... Uh, we, we'd actually done the, the sort of big bad guy fight in the previous session, uh, and mm-hmm. this was sort of more of a kind of closing out epilogue session. Oh, there's a bit, a bit to close out because two of the player characters died in that fight as well. Did. So it was. Um, I like sessions like that though, where you, you just get to role play, mm-hmm. and uh, it was all, all plot driven. Uh, I think there was speaking for myself because I was one of the players, but I think there was some quite nice uh, moments in in that session as well. Yeah, definitely. I thought there was some really good moments in it I, i'm like yourself i really enjoy those kinds of sessions as a gm and as a player T- two reasons as a gm uh one it's great narrative storytelling mm-hmm. two years as a gm you don't have to quite do as much you know there's yes. a lot less <laughs> a lot less number crunching especially if it's the party interacting with each other uh which is i think always... there was uh, there was one skill check rolled in the entire session yeah yeah it wasn't there wasn't a lot uh of dice mm. rolling which is is ideal in that kind of session um so we had uh, a very sort of narrative heavy uh session to close it out uh and it's it's been a, a very long campaign you know we've been uh playing this one for four years three years four years i've lost track it's a good while uh we would have started this with previous character well all of us with previous characters bar scott because mm-hmm. somehow tharek is dwarf cleric has survived everything um, I'm going to say it was 2016. It's not six years ago. No way. It was very shortly after I moved back to Glasgow, and I moved back to Glasgow in 2016. It, tail end of 2016, then? April is when I moved. I think it yeah. might have been tail end of 2016, but yeah. Couldn't need, need to fact check you on this. I don't, uh, I don't. Well, we did the. Was there not the pirate campaign? Were you not back up for the. That's the right. Campaign? Okay, I forgot about that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah we had the, the doomed pirate campaign that lasted two sessions before yeah. we got TPK'd. And then, did we not have the, the doomed Kingmaker campaign as well? Did that not. That was before I moved. Was that before? Okay. Yeah, so many I games, not, I was <laughs> not in on that. Okay, fair enough. But yeah, it's been going on for a, a good long while. You know, we've had crossovers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had four character, uh, four sort of main story arcs that we did because uh, we did Common Cause was the first one, then yep. Darkness Divides, then Tomorrow Brings Many Things, 
mm-hmm. and then uh, this one, which was Assault on Ice, which was the uh, the last one. Uh, and going forward, we'll just be doing uh, crossovers. And uh, I've made you guys aware that we're going to be moving over to 5th edition D&D as well for those. Yes. Um, and personally, I'm happy with that change. Um, if I could surmise how I felt about this particular story arc is... I absolutely loved the characters and the plot of it, but I felt like the mechanics of Pathfinder was just getting in the way. It was just its too much. <laughs> yeah, but that, that was largely why I made the decision. Uh, as much fun as it's been having these high-level characters with, with levels of mythic as well, there was a, a session that I think you will remember quite well. It was fairly recently anyway, but mm. it was... Basically, I think one of your turns took the better part of about half an hour, not because of just any well, fault of your own, just number crunching, basically. Yeah, it's just like, oh, God, what? Uh, how much damage have I actually done? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> and we basically had to sit there with calculators just trying to get yeah, we had, we had an accountant come in, <laughs> like, audit it. Um, uh, it felt, it felt that, that that felt necessary for that. I, uh, I will say, in, in Pathfinder's favour, I'm going to miss some of the big numbers and, like, one-shotting, like, massive monsters as well mm. that my character was able to do. Yeah, um, and, and this is a conversation I have all the time because people say, you know, why do you think Pathfinder's better than D&D and, and vice versa? I don't necessarily think either is the better. I think mm. they both have different draws to them, 100%. I think 5th edition D&D is a simpler system, and that's not mm-hmm. to a, that's not in a detrimental fashion. It's just a bit smoother. It's a bit more streamlined. There's few fewer options, which clo- cause less bloat and cause mm-hmm. less. The, the thing is, right? The more moving parts you have to something, the more likely the gears are going to catch, right? Yes. It, fundamentally, that is the issue that Pathfinder has. It has so much content, and I'm talking about first edition here. It has so much content. It has a wealth of material, classes, feats, archetypes. And it gives you a fantastic range of options. You can make literally any character you could comprehend. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen people make uh, Captain America in Hulk. Uh, I've seen people. There's there's literally magical girls. Al- Alice Le Moon. You know, you can make mm-hmm. this wealth of characters. But the problem is because there's so much to it, the bloat can become quite unwieldy, and it can become very difficult to to manage at a table because there was just you just cannot make a system that big. And, it, and cover all the expectations. It's a bit like Magic yeah. Gathering as well. You know, mm-hmm. that's why they have they have it so that things cycle out because they yeah. just couldn't keep track of things realistically otherwise. Um, mm-hmm. So not to get off, off topic anyway, but that's why I, I think they have, you know, I love Pathfinder, especially at lower levels because you can make any character. And as a GM, there's so much resource for you to draw upon, mm-hmm. be it adventures or uh, optional rules. It's just a, it's a different system. Anyway... I- I, I was just just while we're on that subject, on a similar note to sort of the problem with having too many rules is uh, there's more likely it's more likely that you're gonna find some way of cheesing it and come up <laughs> with like broken characters, which it, I, I would like to say in our defence. Um, we at least consult you <laughs> before we go ahead and do something silly. Yeah, I um, think you guys have always been quite good as a group. And I think this is something that you can do as a, a GM and a group is you set your expectations, right? You set like mm-hmm. what the game is looking to do, what you as a GM will allow and won't allow. And I think as long as your players are flexible and you make them aware of, yes, I will allow. So you could start out and say, I'll allow anything. As long as they understand that you might at some point go, look, I've allowed this, but in actuality, it's unbalanced and we need to pull that back, whether you need to retrain it or whatever mm. that's not going to work you know you guys know i have a, a classic rule which is no swashbucklers, no swashbucklers. No <laughs> like that's that's my like rule going in and when i started the saturday night campaign uh and i said to the guys uh they were like what's on the table what's off the table i was like you know normally i have a no swashbuckler no kinetics rule because it was like a bit of a loosey-goosey lockdown game i was like you know what just play whatever and no one played a swashbuckler or Kinetics, so it was fine. Um, we, all, we all respect you too much, obviously. Yeah, uh, which is really nice, you know, that, that people kind of know that you don't want to kill someone else's enjoyment. Uh, <laughs> that's not funny. That's, that's no, 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 no. It's just... 
<laughs> so yeah, that was uh, that that was always my kind of rule with Pathfinder, and I'm sure I'll have that with Fifth Edition D and D. I'm going to come across things. I'm going to be like, God, I hate this so much. I mean, well, yeah, but I think I, th- I think because there's there's less rules bloat to Fifth Edition. I think it's less likely, basically, and when it does come up with broken stuff it's not going to be as busted no as, i mean but like because it's it's fairly easy to find it in path i mean for example like i just took on an ability with my character which was basically like as a uh, reflex action if someone attacked me i could hit them first mm-hmm. um now because i didn't take a particular is it combat reflexes yeah is is how is a feat that you can take with that to make that absolutely broken because it means you're hitting everyone before they get to hit you. Yeah. Um, and and that's silly. It is. I mean, it is. But if I remember rightly, that's a mythic thing. So you're supposed yes. to be, like this is partially on me, right? Because I I love conceptually, I love mythic. I love characters mm-hmm. being just that much more powerful. But then, as a GM, you have to manage that, and it yeah. is horrendous. You know, like in in the last uh, the last combat session we did before you fought the big bad, who put up a hell of a fight. You know, she killed two of you, mm-hmm. by, um, but before you fought her, you got attacked by a, a Kraglinom, which is a, a Norse dragon. This incredibly powerful thing that I put in, and I was like, right, this is this is going to be a beast, right? They'll they'll have they'll beat it. But it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fight for them, and you one rounded it. You know it came yeah. in, and, and I don't mean you as a party. I mean you, Josh, <laughs> my my character, just and I went, hacked oh. its head off in one swing. <laughs> I was like, well, well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> We've created a monster <laughs> uh, because you know that you just open up that kind of worms for yourself uh, mm. anyway we spoke for for 10 minutes about uh, about that uh, so, so well th- there is one other thing about uh pathfinder slash dnd i want to touch on though because okay, it is ahead. an interesting talking point you've mentioned a one change that we're stipulating that we're going to dnd fifth edition but there was another change that you mentioned in that in the setting we're going to be moving forward by 900 years yeah about nine, 900 years so to give a bit of context to that, the characters, uh, the, the so I've run these two Pathfinder games sort of in tandem mm-hmm. for years now uh, with two different player groups. And when we brought them together for the f- first time, uh, mm-hmm. following their successes, they all gained. Uh, was it the first crossover you got it? Or was it the second? I think it was the first one. Was it the second? It was the second one. Is it? Yeah, because we, we didn't have anything to do with the timekeeper in the first That's crossover. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, in the second crossover, they all sort of went to work for this uh, individual called the Timekeeper, who was basically keeping the timeline right, uh, and yeah. sent them back in time to different points in time to stop uh, these guys from the future uh, from altering the timeline. It was basically a plot of First Contact, right? Star Trek First Contact, which mm-hmm. is the Borg go back in the past to try and change the future. And it, I basically used I used Borg miniatures from uh, from the you Star did. Trek model line to actually represent these guys. So this guy sends you back to stop these uh, Borg, in inverted commas, legally but, distinct. No, legally distinct uh, android <laughs> humanoid uh, yeah. people. Uh, to stop them. And when you go back, he gives you uh, this mythic power and he makes you the Timeless. So the group is uh, sort of united, become known as the Timeless because they don't age, because they're mm-hmm. they're affiliated to the, the Timekeeper. Uh, so obviously that means that when we do this time jump forward of 900 years... The world is going to have progressed 900 years, which is a hell of a mm-hmm. long time. Uh, but you guys will have all remained ageless. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was the, the other big change. And the way that is going to manifest in, in many sort of ways is we're moving to sort of more of a Victorian-esque, uh, steampunky, magic punk uh, setting. So something a little closer to uh, Eberron um, mm-hmm. and steampunk. Uh, aesthetic uh, so yeah that was that was the other second change yeah I'm looking forward to uh, yeah I'm looking forward to seeing how because I've decided that I'm, I'm going to go with low cag yeah with uh, my barbarian for that so I'm looking forward to seeing how he uh, deals with that um, the good thing with low cag is he, he's been he, in character he's been timeless for a while I think he's like five, if I remember he's like 530 odd years old anyway so he's he's 
you'd like to think by that point he would have got used to the idea of being immortal. Yeah. Uh, and maybe handles it a bit better than maybe some of the other characters who might not be so great at handling it. Who knows? Well, you wanted to play Lord Kag as sort of a uh, proto individual. You know, he's, he was mm. one of the first of his his kind yeah. of race to kind of, you know, be civilised in, in so much as uh, mm-hmm. they are civilised uh, in, in the area you've built them from. Because you're, you're basically a barbarian king, right? In, yes. Uh, in your your narrative. Um, which will be interesting because one of the things I'm, I'm throwing to you guys is how has your presence influenced the world in that mm. change? So it'd be interesting how you, you come from this sort of uh, barbarian tribe in the mountains. How have they responded to the rise of technology uh, yeah. and and the reduction of m- magic in the conventional sense and religion, mm-hmm. which are your two usual primary components of D and D. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, so we're looking forward to that. Um, obviously, uh, whenever we do this crossover, is going to be very much dependent on how the rest of the year goes regarding mm-hmm. COVID. But uh, we'll keep you posted on. Um, moving on from that, um, Josh draws a blank. Uh, no. um, I uh, gaming wise this week for me, um, I ordered a bunch of um, new terrain for Warhammer uh, in anticipation of getting some Crusade games in against uh, Tom's Gene Steeler Cult. You you picked up the new codex, although you were saying before we started the recording, you haven't had much of a chance to read into it in depth. Yeah, I picked it up, but it, it got delivered on uh, Saturday. It actually came on time. I did say last episode I didn't think it would, but it did, so kudos to Games, Games Workshop. Workshop. We're clearly listening, and yeah. we're like, well, we've got to show this guy up. These guys are, are high-tier influencers. We need to make yes. sure that we're, uh, <laughs> we're pleasing How we them. laughed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, that arrived on mm. time. Uh, I did... The, the one thing I did look at uh, was I did have a quick gander at the Crusade rules just because I'd never seen them in a codex before. Mm. Uh, so I'm interested to see how that plays out as and when we do get around to playing it. So what what terrain did you get? Let's let's. I so I uh, I ordered from a Czech company called Urban Mats, and what I've done is I've got. Oh yeah, yeah! I've told you this, haven't I? Yeah. Tom started like sniggering. I don't know if the mic picked that up, but. Um, so I ordered from the Czech Republic a double-sided um, map big enough for standard games of uh, Warhammer 40k. Yeah. And I ordered a big set of... It's basically a shelled-out city. Okay. Um, uh, like ruins. Uh, that, yeah. Right. Yeah, basically. Uh, that arrived um, yesterday. So I was actually, before we started the recording, I've unpacked it all and I've set it all out in my gaming room. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, it's it's looking good. We'll get a um, picture up with the with the episode if you if you yeah can yeah I'll shot. do that. Uh, so a couple of things. Um, it, it was not sh- uh, cheap to ship, and I was kind of expecting that. I paid forty euros for shipping because it's coming from the continent mm-hmm. and it's quite bulky. It was actually a lot bulkier than I thought it would be. The box is like up to my hip. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that the terrain came in, and then there's a long tube box for yeah. the uh, the mat itself. I forgot that I would have to pay customs charges on this entering the UK. And I got charged £54 to to receive this That's once rough. it had entered the UK. So thank you, Brexit. Thank you for that. <laughs> and how much did you pay for, like, for the, the thing before customs? Yeah, before I mean, so bear in mind this is including the shipping, which is yeah. quite expensive. I think it came to about two hundred pounds. But that's so, still like a quarter of your your exactly. Island. Well, this is it, and and okay, the people who aren't into some of our listeners who maybe aren't into like miniatures war gaming might think that sounds like a lot. Well, actually, those neoprene mats they cost about seventy, eighty quid themselves. Yeah. And all of this, all of the terrain is like resin cast, pre-painted terrain. So it's yeah. like just good to go. So uh, I, that's the kind of money I was anticipating on spending on this. 
but the yeah, I completely forgot about the customs charges. So, but, <laughs> but I mean, what 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 can I do? <laughs> it's like, That's well, like, you've got you've got me, your royal highness. <laughs> this, this is it. It's kind of got you by the balls, hasn't it? Because it's like, do you want it or not? Because that's, yeah. that's ultimately where I pay, you are. I'm paid now. Yeah. So. I, you're, um, you're, you're kind of buggered one way or the other. So, yeah, that's uh, that's not fun, though. I do feel for you there, mate. The trouble... Um, the, see, I, I found this when I was buying a bunch of uh, terrain uh, a couple of years back for Kill Team from, like, TT Combat. I find it quite addictive. So mm-hmm. now that I've got this, here's the thing. I... This city doesn't have roads, so I've spotted like a set of like uh, neoprene roads that you can just roll out onto the the right. field as well. And then I'm thinking it would be cool to get like some rubble and like barbed wire and tank traps and craters and all of that as well. So I might I'm, mm, I might might go to town a bit before uh, before you pop down. I'm just gonna uh, come down and it's gonna game. be like a full experience. You know, you've converted a room of your house. You've done like the walls up as we're in cities. It's like I, I give you a helmet. Bit... I give you a helmet as soon as you walk through the door. There's like ambient like... noise, smoke machines going off, yeah. sirens. Josh, you may have overdone it here. <laughs> I have seen the little. You can get little terrain pieces that have like uh, little smoke vapor coming out yeah. of them as well. And the LED um, lights as well and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. That would be really like that would be really cool. Imagine going to like a a, a war gaming venue, uh, and it was like that. You know, like it was like all kind of atmospherically set. Because it's a little bit like what Warhammer World used to be like, where you know they had the castle and that. And I know they still have it, mm. but they really kind of stayed in that aesthetic, and they had like the Lord of the Rings yeah. music on and stuff like that. Um, imagine going to like a like a kind of laser tag. But as a war gaming thing, so you know you've got like the noises mm. and sound effects, and you've got music, and you've got atmospheric lighting and smoke machines and stuff. See, that's a business idea right there for you. The war gaming let's experience. <laughs> yeah, let's do it, man. I'm all about that. So, um, and the only other thing I was going to mention was, uh, can you guess how I approach? Because you mentioned you, you had a flick through your code. Can you imagine? Can you guess how I approach uh, reading new codices and rules books and the like? I don't know. I, you don't strike me as the most narrative focused of people, so I don't know if you maybe just go like straight to the stats and like just that's your book really. That's the second thing I do. Okay, that's the, the first thing is I look at the pictures. Oh yeah, like that's a given. Yeah. Like okay, all right, okay. So you you do that as well. Yeah, everybody looks at the pictures first. Yeah, like, you know, there's like, not there's ooh, not pretty a, miniatures. Yeah, there's not a person, especially with like such a visual hobby. Like you're mm. gonna look at the pictures first. And to GW's credit, you know they've they've always done really good art and they've always done really good like uh, dioramas and things for for yeah. codexes. Even back in like yesteryear when the codexes were crappy black and white things the pictures were always the best bit. i i have very fond memories of the third edition warhammer 40k rule book and mm-hmm. that was absolutely rammed with like illustrations and just law like just all of the the fluff yeah. uh, with, with the 41st millennium and of course that's the kind of the first edition where they established the tone of warhammer 40k as being grim dark yeah. This is this is uh this is the sort of gothic horror science fiction that uh, we know and love now. The problem I have with with codexes is, is with the law side of it at least. And this is going to come across as a bit snobby and it's not meant to. But I've already kind of read it all. Like it tends to yeah. be kind of a repeat of if you've read one Gene Steeler codex, you've probably read, you know, the next Gene Steeler codex when it comes to law. You'll have a few like tweaks and expansions and you know things like that but largely they tend to say the same thing yeah over and over. i mean see like space marines jesus like you just don't bother <laughs> like uh um, and this guy was awesome yeah. and his friend was also <laughs> awesome and his friend was also awesome and they all high-fived each other after winning yeah right. <laughs> which they did because they're space yes marines. they're space marines um, <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, here's the thing: like, they they have to include that, right? They have to they have to assume everyone reading that book is reading is is it new to the hobby. Yeah, yeah, and and that's why I don't begrudge them it. But you do as like a as a new uh, as a new as an existing mm. uh, player, you do kind of get a bit of repetition. It'd be nice if they just released uh, a stat only book, like you know, that was like no law, 
you just know, like, the rules. Like just a budget. You could do like a, even like a budget book that was like a smaller black and white book, you know, softback. That's just your rules because that'd be great for tournaments and stuff as well. So here is the thing: there are online resources where you can access just the rules for free. Are there? Not official ones. All right. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, talking I'm not. things like one d one d four chan and that that sort of stuff. Josh, I don't so, subscribe to or encourage people to participate in piracy or illegal I, publications. I think there's an actual loophole because it's rules. You right. can't. You can't. Uh, there's something about copyright law and rule, like the rules of a game being a bit weird. Right. Um, of, of course, Games Workshop is going to try and stop them from doing that. Mm-hmm. But the, the fact of the matter is, um, if, if, if you weren't that bothered about having the physical codex and like having that collector's piece, you can access the rules if you want to. The thing is, though, for me, even if even if I just got the rules bit, I would still want it officially. Like, I'd still want mm-hmm. a proper... Because okay, fair enough. For, for everything that we might say about Games Workshop, and I know I've... I've said a lot of negative things on this very show uh mm-hmm. but they do release some some good quality products like you know mm-hmm. the codexes are always always deliver a good you know bit of text um and even their their smaller books you know i've got some of the, like the the smaller necromunda uh support mm-hmm. things and they're still really nice you know they're only little pa- like pamphlets almost but still good quality they're still you know nice to look at and i would like that with like just rules you know just just a rule sheet a bit like the data cards but i don't like cards for wargaming like it just it yeah. doesn't sit right with me it's, it like takes me back to like dark millennium like when right. you had like oh and i'm like i don't want that someone's gonna start pulling out vortex grenades and wiping out half the battlefield and i'm just not for no. that anymore <laughs> stop that uh, <laughs> so yeah I, I like sort of you know a uh an easier to access resource that still looks nice that would be Mm-hmm. That'd be on my wish list. Pathfinder do it, funnily enough. Um, Pathfinder started doing the the pocket rule books, which are like a smaller, condensed uh, version for taking to mm. uh, like events and taking to your friend's house and stuff. So they, they're they're a really good example of the kind of thing. I don't think they actually strip out any content. It's just sort of smaller and than the bumps bumps taken out. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Then there we go. So Games Workshop, get on it. Yeah. So um, yeah, do it. Just do it. Speaking yeah. of uh, condensed content, uh, this, is, this is a tenuous link, I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> mm. uh, do you want to talk about this archaeological board game? I was wondering how we're gonna, yeah. how you were going <laughs> to link that to condensed content, and I'm like, there's, there's, there's no link. The link no, is, what, what the is link this is, segue? The link is that, that I'm condensing our content by segueing onto it. <laughs> I see. Okay. That's why I said um, I don't know how I'm going to link this in. I will. I'll allow it. Okay, thanks. Um, it's too this kind. This is all really. going to get left in. But, That's fine. But yeah, it, just a sort of interesting little news piece that came out earlier this week. We're going to link the news at the article uh, below. But the headline is, Archaeologists have unearthed a 4,000-year-old board game. Now they just have to figure out the rules. So, um, this is a uh, joint col- a collaboration between a Polish and a, um, an academic team in Oman. I don't know what the um, collect. What would the the collective uh, noun be for you know the, the people of Oman? You know, like how people from Poland are Polish. Omanians. What would Oman? Omanian. Yeah, um, that's terribly ignorant of me, but I, I genuinely don't know. In any case, uh, a, a collaborative effort between two academic teams have been conducting uh, archaeological digs in Oman, and they have uncovered a 4,000-year-old stone board game at a Bronze and Iron Age settlement uh, site near the village of Ain Bani uh, Seda in, um, in, in sort of the, uh, the uh, northern uh, mountains there. Uh, I'm going to quote it directly from the article here. Such finds are rare, but examples are known from an uh, area stretching from India through Mesopotamia, even to the eastern Mediterranean. Um, This is uh, Pieter 
Bielinski, apologies for butchering, butchering your surname there, Pieter, um, from the University of Warsaw, um, who who's co-leading the excavations. The most famous example of a board game based on a similar principle is the one from the graves uh, from Ur, and this was, uh, they, they, they explained that this was a dig from 1922, uh, which found a 4,500-year-old board game um a two-player game similar to Backgammon, it, but it's. It, I just find it interesting that they um, they cannot figure out the rules for it. Yeah. Um, so they've they've said here, uh, newly discovered large stone board in Oman has grid-like markings, seemingly indicating different fields of play as well as cup holes. Its rules have now been lost to time. Do you think this is sort of the uh, the uh, historic equivalent of like twilight imperium or something you know it's just like maybe a yes <laughs> what we don't realize is this is actually just one tile of the yeah. game <laughs> yeah it actually has like 20 tiles that all join together and yep. it's a eight player uh weekend campaign <laughs> six, six expansions as well that were released yes uh <laughs> it is like if you look at the uh the article like it it does look like quite a complex board. Like there's, there's a lot of, going on. Yeah, there's like six different tiles. I think at a quick glance, and maybe five. The board is asymmetrical. The board as well, is asymmetrical. Is... It's got like weird like diamonds down the side at certain points, which might mean something. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the different symbols mean, if anything. I mean, we could be overcomplicating this. This could just be like a weird form of like checkers, right? But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a weird looking game to say the least like if that dropped at you know like Essen or something people would be like what, what's this <laughs> this is weird so I do, I do find it interesting just the sheer number of ancient board games though mm-hmm. um, because we all kind of think that board games are a fairly recent thing and then you've got chess which has been around for a long time mm-hmm. but um I've, I've seen a ton of different ones there's a, an egyptian one that i've seen uh, demonstrated at various conventions um the um which i was sure and i can never remember the name of it and all pronounce it to be honest there's the viking game that is similar to chess but different as well, in, in that you've got a very clear attacker and defender mm-hmm. scenario. Um, I just, yeah, it's just, uh, I just find it fascinating. See, I'm going to be a bit contrary here because I don't, I, I do find it fascinating, but I don't find it surprising because what the bugger mm. else are you going to do, right? Like, you've got <laughs> no TV, no computer <laughs> games, you've got nothing, right? You've got nothing on the cards for you, right? All you've got is like disease. <laughs> War and time, right? That's that's all you really have. Uh, procreating, procreating, but you can only do that so much, right? And like, <laughs> laboring in the fields, or you know, whatever whatever your job is at that period, or building mm. the pyramids, you know, all these kind of uh, very manual labor. So that's why, like in 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 historical periods, storytelling was such like a, a pivotal part of yeah. society, and like storytellers would get like the best seats in the house and stuff because. Mm-hmm. That was that was TV, right? That was entertainment. It's like yeah. everybody puts their TV in the best spot in the living room because it gets mm-hmm. the most attention, right? So that's how they would treat storytellers. I'm getting a bit sort of pseudo philosophical mm-hmm. here, but it's true, right? Um, mm-hmm. So if you were sat around where and you, you're going to have creativity, you're going to have smart people, and you've got like a bit of wood and some rocks, you're going to be like, right, well, let's see, like who can get a rock this far and that just kind of evolves right as you mm. and you go right, let's put some carvings in it right now who can get like the rock over there past that rock and let's make the rock look fancy not to make it like a horse and then that's how these things evolve so it i don't actually i actually think it's surprising we haven't found more of this yeah and there's not more records of it and i suppose y- you were limited by education obviously being a factor what people you know didn't really work sociable hours you know where they would have had time to sit down and make this kind of stuff mm-hmm. uh you know that i don't imagine there would have been any kind of person whose job it was to make this kind of stuff either except for maybe like you know the equivalent of jesters and entertainers so mm-hmm. potentially that's maybe why just because of how life was at that point but it doesn't surprise me that these exist and it doesn't surprise me how many exist i think it's i think it's quite telling that you know 
we we would have more board games if we didn't have other methods of entertainment now you know tvs computers tablets Mm -hmm. you know it's in a way we we've sort of stifled our own creativity in that that field because we've put it into to other fields I've got a theory as to what's happened to all of these ancient board games. We all thought the Alexand- uh, the Library of Alexandria was books. Now that was Pharaoh's uh, board game collection. That there would be go. really cool. <laughs> like, imagine like they eventually, you know, they find some ancient library and it's just like all the board game collections. You know, there's just like a faded, a faded hieroglyph of like geek retreat up in the top. Yeah. <laughs> Good lord, he had he had seventeen different versions of Monopoly. Yeah. How did that that how did that even exist back then? <laughs> like... So I think um, this is one of the quick thing I, I want to touch on because uh, mm. I haven't touched on it for a while, uh, at least in any any depth. Um, which is a new expansion has come out for uh, Marvel's Legendary. So yeah, uh, regular listeners uh, and long time sufferers of, of my love of this game. Uh, we'll know that this is one of the many, many Marvel games. Many Marvel uh, that editions. I, that I collect. Um, so there hasn't been that many expansions for Legendary recently because of COVID. Uh, there were mm-hmm. four planned for last year and I think one dropped. Uh, so this is the most recent one uh, that's come out. It's one of the deluxe uh, releases, which means it's slightly bigger than the normal expansions they do. Uh, and this is called Messiah Complex. Uh, so this is uh, I'll, I'll read out a bit of the, the blurb for it uh, the decimation of mutants has come to pass and the enemies of the remaining X-Men never rest in this new legendary expansion uh, based on the popular Marvel crossover story arc you will join the ranks of the surviving mutant heroes in a race against new masterminds and villains to find a very special child who represents hope for the mutants uh oh. so this is one of the things they've been doing recently with legendary so they they have done it historically but like when the first sets came out they tended to be like team focused so you have fantastic yes. four and spider-man and x-men uh and things like that and then they started to move more to kind of like sets based on events and the characters mm-hmm. in those events so then you've got like annihilation uh secret war one and two civil war uh, so this is obviously drawing from the partly from the Messiah Complex uh, story arc. Uh, I've just noticed the website that I'm looking at is spelt deck wrong, uh, not in a not in a good way. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's uh, that's coming out, and I'm I'm super excited about that because I just love a bit of legendary. Of course, of course, it's been a while since I've played it. I, it, it last time I played it, it was probably round at yours at some point. Yeah, I think. You were you and Will are the last two people I've probably played it with. It, it, you can play mm-hmm. it on your own, right? And I I have played it solo, but it mm-hmm. it's not as fun, right? It's like it, it it's one of those games that I think really benefits from having at least two people in mm-hmm. it. Like Marvel Champions, you can play solo and still enjoy it. Uh, yes. Although I'm just not a big solo player in general because I just yeah. get bored. Um, <laughs> Fair. Because I need the banter and you know the the interaction. Mm-hmm. Legendary though, just it's it I always falls flat for me when I try and play it solo and I get like halfway through a game and I'm like, This is damn done. This, I need yeah. I need Josh here to be building a really annoying card drawing deck just to really rail no, me I, up. No, no, here's the thing, right? So I know even though that's the way I really want to play, I know it winds other people up, so I don't play that way. The thing is it's it's, it's a very valid tactic and it, it does actually usually make for really strong decks. Problem is, yes. it's boring as hell for everyone yeah. else because it's uh, me. Because my turn takes like half an yeah, hour. <laughs> uh, it, it's just not not the most fun. Uh, but no, I'm I'm really looking forward to to another one of those. I'm I'm in the position, unfortunately, where I've had a few expansions come out and I've not played that much. So like Annihilation, mm. obviously Messiah Complex. There's even a few before that that I haven't really done much with. That I'm like the next time I play, I'm going to be like choice paralysis. I just like I don't know which one to play. Can you? Um, how feasible is it for you to bring it down with you uh, when we're when we're going to get some forty k in? Uh, it is not. <laughs> cool. Uh, Good talk. Le- legendary <laughs> is on my shelf, even with the cards in boxes. Is in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine 
Uh, I'm not suggesting the whole thing. I'm just suggesting like the the bits that you would need to play these new expansions. I mean, I could I could pre-set up a few games and bring the yeah. stuff to run those games. I suppose if I decanted it sort of into a box, it would still yeah. be a sizable amount of stuff. I okay. suppose, but yeah, if I left some characters and, and villains behind, yeah, I could give it a go. It's viable. I, I will. I will Maybe, give this some well, consideration. Well, I, I, I suppose it's a kind of like how much effort do you want to put into this? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's we're going to be playing Crusade. Like, I, I'd like to like yeah. focus focus on Crusade. Yeah, cool. focus my interest because I don't want to just be gaming. You know, I like to actually hang out with with you. Contrary yeah. to how I treat you on the podcast, uh, I do enjoy your company. <laughs> Contrary to how you treat me on the podcast and in real life. And in- <laughs> Uh, well, I feel less so in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, should we should we draw things to a close on on that note? Yeah, yeah I think that's a good uh, a good before to before we sign off. Just as always, a little reminder. Um, obviously, what we do here isn't free. We've got uh, subscriptions to pay for, equipment to buy. Uh, so as such, we've, if you like what you're listening to, we have a Patreon that you can uh, go and show your support for us as, for as little as uh, a pound a month. Every every little penny helps. Uh, just keep everything running. So uh, the link will be down below should you wish to do so. Yeah, we'd really appreciate every little bit of support we get. Yeah, excellent. And on that note, uh, thank you guys as always for listening. And until next time, take care. Bye. Bye.